Welcome, everyone. Let me apologize first for our slight delay and for the horrible parking and traffic. Um, uh, we understand it was very difficult to get here tonight and we're delighted to see as many of you as have made it. So, um, I'd like to welcome you to this inaugural lecture in our new series called Engaging Asia, Lessons and Perspectives. My name is Sharon Karstens. I'm the director for the Institute for Asian Studies here at Portland State. Um, and also a professor of anthropology. Um, so I want to first just say a few words about this new series. As you know, PSU prides itself in both its engaged scholarship and its collaborative work with community partners. Learning by doing is a motto that both faculty and students here put into regular practice. Now as a cultural anthropologist and someone who has lived and worked for extensive periods of time in Taiwan, in China, in Singapore, and especially in Malaysia, I'm personally familiar with the challenges of adapting my practices to the very different cultural settings of Asia. And as a teacher, I've also learned that my students find both my accounts and those of others working in international settings especially meaningful. In fact, one of the favorite books of the students in a class that I teach regularly on research methods is an edited volume put together by anthropologists um, who are reflecting on their fieldwork experiences. And the title of it is, quote, Stumbling Toward the Truth. <laughs> so our new series then will invite speakers who have professionally engaged with different parts of East and Southeast and South Asia to generously share their experiences and um, with the type of eager audience that we have here tonight. Um, our upcoming speakers will include professionals from diverse backgrounds in business, in law, in journalism, the arts, and more. Um, we plan to host two speakers a year for this series. Um, we will videotape all of these um, events and we'll post them on the Institute for Asian Studies website so that we can um, reach an even broader audience. And then we are going to compile these um, presentations um, probably in three years or so, and we want to put together an edited volume um, that can showcase the kinds of, of rich um, collaboration and rich um, uh, experiences that our speakers are sharing with us. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to some other exciting lectures sponsored by the Institute for Asian Studies in the coming months. Um, in particular, um, on Thursday, May 9th, um, Dr. Hyung Il Pai from the University of California, Santa Barbara, is going to be talking about um, heritage tourism in Korea, and we expect it to be a very, very interesting talk. On Tuesday, May 14th, um, one of our own faculty members in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, Dr. Sri Nair, is going to talk about lesbian fiction as historical fiction in the South Asian novel. And then on Wednesday, May 29th, Dr. Sherman Cochran, a very famous China historian from Cornell University, is going to come and talk about his new book, The Liu's of Shanghai, about a Shanghai business um, family um, during the mid-20th century. So um, we invite you to return for these um, events and to share with us in these exciting speakers. So finally, I would like to introduce Kimball Ferris who will in turn introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Kimball Ferris is a partner at Miller Nash LLP, where he specializes in banking and finance, mergers and acquisitions, real estate, business, and international business law. Um, he sent me that information and I said, okay, so how do I connect you with Pete? <laughs> um, he said that, like Pete, um, he actually has a wide range of international experience. In his previous position as partner at Boulevant House, Hauser Bailey, he served as their delegate to the international law group, Multi-Law, and he worked with a diverse group of law firms in many parts of the world. 
But he met Pete through the Arlington Club, where they are both past presidents, and it was there that they became friends. And so um, he has generously agreed to share a few insights on Pete Nickerson, his friend and colleague, in his introduction tonight. So I turn it over to Kimball Ferris. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for that kind introduction. It would be easy to introduce Pete just by talking about his accomplishments and his achievements and his successes and all the predictable reasons why Pete will be a great resource for the Institute of Asian Studies. And while I don't want to spend too much time on that, protocol requires that I spend a certain amount of watching Pete work the room. It looks like he knows most everybody here, but uh, in case you don't know Pete, uh, Pete parlayed a 1979 degree from the University of Oregon, majoring in poli sci with a minor in Chinese, and his start, the start of his career at Nike into achieving singular success as an international businessman. Uh, Pete was the co-founder of GrowthLink Overseas Company, a private Hong Kong-based investment firm established in 1988 that invests in manufacturing, distribution, and retail businesses that operate in China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. These businesses currently employ over 87,000 people with annual gross sales of about a billion US dollars, and Pete is the only Westerner in that organization. Pete's also the co-founder and a principal of China's Asset Management, a fund dedicated to providing American investors with access to investment opportunities in the business expansion that's occurring in China and India. Pete is a frequent traveler to Asia, and in addition to his beautiful home in Portland, Pete's resided with his wife, Chris, 27 years of marriage and their family of four, in Taipei, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Pete's fluent in Mandarin and is always working to hone that skill. And I'll tell you a little story about that later. That's kind of fun. Uh, Pete sits on boards of directors of private companies and some that are traded on the Taiwan Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. He's also on the board of directors of Johns Hopkins Nanjing Center for Chinese and American Studies, and the Portland State University Foundation. So, that's the resume. And of course, he did all of that with entrepreneurial drive and the kind of energy that made it happen, and I want to focus a little more on that. How do you measure success? I want to introduce Pete by thinking about how, to, how you measure success. Now, some people may think you have to be of Danish extraction and 6.5, six foot four and have blonde hair, but, but that's just the surface. As Shannon mentioned, Sharon mentioned, I first met Pete at Arlington Club, and Pete was a club president and I was on his board of directors, and my introduction to Pete was to watch him operate as a leader. He was respectful and sought out the views of others. He talked less and listened more, and when Pete made a decision, that was the decision. But it was always principled, reasoned, and an appropriate decision. And despite his many successes, Pete is a very modest man who lives by the rules. I remember one time I was riding a, as a passenger in uh, an airplane that Pete was piloting. I don't know about you, but I don't pilot airplanes, but Pete does. And Pete said, all right, if you're going to be in the co-pilot seat, he very gently told me what I was going to do, which was to work with him through the methodical, step-by-step, -step, systematic review of the pre-flight checklist and routine. So the point is no shortcuts, no skipping, no funny business. He treated flying the way he treated life with great respect and attention to detail. It's a serious business, and I felt very safe flying with Pete. But Pete's not all business. He's got a disarming sense of humor, and he likes to laugh, especially at himself. 
Pete tells a story a short time after he arrived in China several years ago when he was trying to hail a taxi. Now, Pete, you're going to have to ask Pete to tell you the real story. I'm going to give you sort of an abbreviated version. But so after, after this meeting, Pete decided he needed to take a cab home. And it was a short fare. It wasn't far off. And uh, you had to line up to wait for your taxi. It was a big, long line. And eventually, it was Pete's turn. So he worried about what's going to happen, because it's a short fare. And what if they just drive off? And he said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll tell him that it's a short trip, but I'll give you a nice tip. So the first cab drives up and rolls down the window, and Pete, in his best Chinese, tells him, short drive, but I'll give you a, a nice tip. Boom. The car drives off. The cab drives off. Next cab comes up. Boom. Cab drives off. Next one. Boom. Cab drives off. And everybody's Pete's starting to worry, what do they think back in the line? What's going on? And, he said, something's wrong. What, what's wrong? What, what's going on? So he focused a little bit on exactly what he was saying. And he realized that he's saying, I know it's a short ride, but if you take me there, I'll give you a Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> Pete, I told I shared some stories. I think we all have some like that. And some people say they don't know, don't know Pete that well. And it's probably because Pete doesn't talk that much about himself. He's more interested in you, in listening to you, and hearing what you have to say. He makes you feel that your opinion matters, that he's interested in what you have to say, that you're saying something meaningful and that he hasn't thought of. He makes you feel good. And he, he does that by respecting you, and he builds teams by doing that. And building teamwork is a big part of leadership. And that's, that's one of the reasons I think Pete, like, so many people like Pete. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? But Pete doesn't necessarily like everybody. He doesn't like people who cheat on life's rules. He doesn't like you if you disparage life's traditions. If you're arrogant, disrespectful, rude, Pete's not going to be spending a lot of time with you. So what does that all tell us about Pete? Why is Pete such a wonderful choice to help lead and support the Institute for Asian Studies? It's because Pete exemplifies how to succeed. The cliche that nice guys finish last is a myth. Don't believe that myth. Nice guys finish first every bit as much as selfish, prideful egotists, and they finish way ahead in the game of life but they just don't publicize it so much. So how do you succeed doing business in Asia? Well, Pete might tell you it's being there or being lucky like Forrest Gump, but don't believe it for a minute. From my perspective, if you succeed, it will be following Pete's lead and doing things like seizing opportunities when they're presented to you, insisting on competence, developing and sustaining relationships, and ensuring the availability of needed financial resources, and doing it at all with the character and life values that are Pete Nickerson. So I expect I've embarrassed Pete at this point, and if so, I apologize, my friend, but I think it's important for everybody to know at least my truth about Pete Nickerson and how lucky I think you all to be able to work with him. Yes, the Institute of Asian Studies is blessed to have Pete on its leadership team, just as I'm blessed to call Pete my friend. And now, the reason you came here is to hear Pete tell his story. And one last hint, as Pete tells the story, listen between the lines, because he won't spell it all out for you. And without introduction, Mr. Nickerson, the platform is yours. Thank you, Kim. That's the best introduction I've ever had. And in light of the late time and the detail that Kim went to, I suggest we stop here and go over to the reception and call it a night. <laughs> OK. Before I start, I wanted to ask, are there any military veterans in the room? If so, could you raise your hand just for a moment? I thank you. I wanted to assure you of our gratitude for your sacrifice. Thank you.
I'm going to tell you five things tonight. The first is a few words about the Institute, a little bit more than what Sharon said. The second is to describe who I am. Third, how did I get here? Fourth, share with you some learnings and some conclusions and some uh, lessons that I have in the experience that I'll tell you about. And last, if there's time, we'll take some questions. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Sound is working great, thanks. So first, some words about the Institute. I've been back in Portland now for about 15 years, and in the context of my profession and the time that I've spent in Asia, I've been struck by two things here in Portland and in Oregon in general. The first is how many people have an interest in Asia, have been to Asia, or have a deep experience in Asia, and come back to Portland. There are a lot of us. The second thing that has struck me is that there doesn't appear, at least known to me, to be a center of gravity for that knowledge here in Portland. I don't know where to go to meet enough like-minded people or to hear their experiences to compare notes. And I think the Institute of Asian Studies, as has been exemplified in other big urban universities, can be the appropriate tool for that. So I'm enthusiastic about it. There are two people that have inspired me to join as I have. The first is Dr. Ken Ruoff, who is a, an acclaimed author and professor of history here at Portland State. He's also the director of the Japanese Center, or the Center for Japanese Studies, and he has created exactly the model that we hope to replicate in the Institute of Asian Studies. And Ken is sitting over here. If you could just raise your hand. Thank you, Ken. Uh, secondly is Dr. Sharon Karstens, who you met. She is professor of anthropology here at Portland State. And she is, and her staff, who are mingled about here, are doing all the heavy lifting in creating this model that we want to replicate. Thanks, Sharon. OK, then I'm on to my second point, and that is to describe who I am. There are a couple details Ken missed. I was born at Emanuel Hospital over on the other side of the river, went to Madison High School, down to the University of Oregon, took a degree in political science, a minor in Chinese, as he said, then went to Taiwan, lived in Shanghai, lived in Guangzhou, back to Hong Kong, Singapore for a couple years, and back to Portland for 15 years. And in the course of those 20 or almost 30 years, started a business that makes shoes that isn't particularly romantic, but it's financially successful. And that brings us to today. And as far as I'm concerned, that's about as much story needs to be told. But Sharon insisted that I give some more detail. So <laughs> I'll go on. And that's my third point. And that is, how did I get here? I have a fraternity brother who is in my roommate, who is in the room, who often describes me as Forrest Gump. And I think that's pretty accurate in that, as you'll hear, the rest of my talk, <laughs> my, my journey has been laced with Gumpian adventure. I hope everybody can recognize that. The journey for me really began, and I'm going to see if I can get this to work, with this cup. And this cup is the same as that cup held by my assistant, able assistant, Carol Merrill. And it looks Chinese, but it's Japanese. And it was purchased by my father in the 1960s over at Import Plaza in Old Town which is where all Portlanders went in the 60s and maybe the 70s to buy foreign things from Asia. And he bought these things and brought them home because he had spent time in the US Navy during the war and had in uh, the Pacific. And he had a very romantic imagination about Asia, which he shared with his children. This, for a long time, was a seemingly innocuous icon in my house. I got the chance to go to the University of Oregon, 
And in those days, 1975, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have computers that we could all personally use. And registration for freshmen, juniors, seniors was done in person on the spot. And in those days at the University of Oregon, it was done at Mac Court. And the freshmen were on the fourth day, so pickings were slim. And I, can rem I had a sister who was going to be a junior at the University of Oregon, and she volunteered to help shepherd me through the process. And I can remember walking through the doors of Mac Court with her, and as we went through, you walk into that big cavern of Mac Court, and she said to me, so Pete, are you going to go for a BA or a BS? And to give you an idea of how much I'd prepared for college, I asked her, what's the difference? <laughs> she explained the difference, and we both concluded that I probably was not best at applied science, so by default, I should go for a BA, which meant that now I had to have a language. And she said, which language should you study? And the image of this cup popped into my head. You'll recall also that in the 70s, China, or Japan, was taken over the world. They were hot. And I said to her, I want to study Japanese. So we got in line, and picture Mac Court, and all around the inside are tables with people sitting there ready to take your registration request. And we found the table for Japanese, and we lined up. And I think I was sixth or seventh in line. And we worked our way to the front. And when I got to the front, the registrar said, can I help you? Yes, I'd like to sign up for first year Japanese. And she said, I'm so sorry, we're full. But, she said, our new Chinese department has space. Why don't you take Chinese? And I looked at my sister, and she nodded. I stepped over, and I signed up for first year Chinese. Now, you got to admit, that's Gumpian. <laughs> the good thing about that, well, there were a number of them, but early on was that because, and my, I hope my memory is serving me right, that that was uh, the first year that the University of Oregon was offering Chinese as a course. And to my mind, after a few weeks, I thought I had discovered a gold mine. It seemed to me that the university had failed to properly calibrate the amount of work it took for six credit hours per term. And by that I mean I didn't have to work very hard to get six credit hours. I thought it was fantastic. Secondly, and those in the room who have experience with the Chinese language, to Westerners, Chinese is daunting. You see the characters, you hear it spoken, it is very foreign. But spoken Chinese is really quite simple. There are a few sounds that are foreign to us, that are new, but spoken, virtually every sentence is subject, verb, object. You don't have to conjugate the verbs for tense or for gender. It's quite simple. So within a couple of years, I had caught on. And after, a, after two years, I had enough credit to uh, satisfy my degree. I thought, hey, I might as well just continue. So I ended up having enough hours uh, to make it my minor. I can remember in the spring of my senior year chatting up one of the teacher's assistants in my Chinese class. And she was not very impressed with my ability to speak. And she said, you know, you ought to consider going to Taiwan when you're finished here to improve your spoken Chinese. And I didn't have any better ideas. And again, those of us that are old enough in the room to remember, there weren't very many opportunities for undergraduate students to go to China. We had just normalized relations with China, so there really weren't any opportunities. So I went to Taiwan. After I got to Taiwan, this would have been 1979, very late. I discovered that what most foreign students did when they got there was teach English to support themselves. And I discovered that one of my floor mates in the dormitory was going back to Philadelphia, and he had three jobs, English teaching jobs, that he was ready to pass on. And so I looked at the list, and there I spotted Nike. And I said, hey, I know that company. 
And he said, yeah, you should take that one because it's a good way to get a free pair of shoes. <laughs> so I took the job. And after a few months, it was beginning to be time to go back, uh, to come back to Oregon. My time at the uh, Language Center was over. And I was talking to one of the secretaries in the Nike office there in Taipei. I admit I was attracted to her. And we were talking about what the future would bring. And I was telling her that I was going to go back to the United States, and my goal was to be a diplomat or a spy, something like that, <laughs> something important. And she said, oh, you know, Nike is talking about going to China. This is 1980 now. And she said, you ought to uh, apply with Nike. And I unwisely said, well, who would want to work for a shoe company? <laughs> and she smiled and nodded, and that's the last time I saw her. I met another girl who was on loan from Ohio State, a Buckeye in Taiwan, and she had already gone back to Ohio, and I followed her there. And I found myself working in a Sears store on the graveyard shift as a janitor to support myself while I courted her. And I got that job because I knew how to work a floor polisher. I'd learned to do that in the fraternity. And after a few months of running that floor polisher, I started to reflect on the conversation that I'd had with the girl in Taiwan and thinking maybe that shoe job doesn't sound so bad. So I threw contacts uh, from school, I managed to meet somebody at Nike and have a discussion with them. And I got a job with them because I spoke Chinese. The first thing they did was move me to New Hampshire where they had an R&D facility. I was there for a year and for those who don't know, this might be so common that I'm wasting time, but the, in those days and today, Nike doesn't actually manufacture very much, not much. They're designers research and development, and the world's best marketers and promoters. And they rely on independent third-party vendors to manufacture all the products that they design. So after a year in Exeter, New Hampshire, I married that girl from Columbus, Ohio. We've been married for 31 years, and my son is coming. I think he's stuck in the traffic, but I wanted to show you the, the product of a buckeye and a duck. <laughs> He'll, he'll be coming. And uh, moved to Taiwan and worked in one of Nike's vendors factories for about a year, learning the details of manufacturing. We then moved to Shanghai in April, April 11th of 1983. And to set the stage for you a little bit, in 1983, Shanghai was a city of 11 million people. And there were roughly 150 foreigners in the whole city. That was made up of eight Americans from Nike. Here, here's my son right here, so you can have a glance at, at Lucas. <laughs> Luke, come on up here. Robin, Robin's sitting up here in the middle. Sorry to embarrass you. A city of 11 million Chinese, 150 foreigners, eight of them were from Nike. Uh, there were probably 15 other Americans, and the rest were made up of Japanese, Australians, British, and most of the Eastern Bloc. I'd say more than half are from the Eastern Bloc. In order to get to Shanghai, there were two flights a week from Hong Kong. That's it. There were uh, roughly 200 taxis in the city. You could not hail a taxi on the street. You had to call it and book it. And sometimes it would take an hour, and sometimes it might take a week for you to get <laughs> that. That is literal. Same thing for phone calls. We didn't have cell phones. There was no direct dial in China. Every call had to go through an operator. It was a privilege to have a, a phone in your office, let alone in your house. And to make a long distance call, you had to book that through the operator. The longest I waited for a call was three days. Probably most important is to point out that 
The law in those days was that the 150 foreigners could not have any unofficial contact with the 11 million Chinese. So we were isolated. To summarize it, I could say that it was very difficult to do business. To give you some business context, Phil Knight said in 1980 that by 1985, his vision was that Nike would source roughly 25% of their product out of China. By 1985, we were getting less than half a percent out of China. And I can exemplify or describe that for you by telling you what I call the tale of two Chinas. I want to make sure I've got that right. Wrong story. Clash of two cultures. That's the story I'm going to tell you first. The first culture is the Chinese culture in the early 80s, and that is that they have just emerged from the Cultural Revolution. Their society is 5,000 years old. They have been taught for the last 20 years and maybe longer that Westerners are bad, that capitalism is bad, that Americans are bad, there are significant virtues to the socialist, communist, Chinese system. And they run what's called a centralized, planned economy. That's the first culture. The second culture was the culture I came from. In this case, Americans from Nike. And all that you need to do is picture John McEnroe, and that says it all. Young in your face, know-it-alls from a country that was 200 years old, that worked in an economy that was market-based, that said that if you designed and built a blue shoe with a white stripe and delivered it on Tuesday, you had a great chance of economic success. And those two cultures simply could not communicate with each other. One of the main reasons for that is that the Chinese had gone about eradicating, eliminating, the class of people that had any understanding of my culture. And we didn't have very many people that were willing to go to China to understand, who, who did understand their culture. So to summarize it, I can say that it was a failure for both sides. The solution, which many people had thought about, was to bring Nike's traditional suppliers from Taiwan or Korea to China to marshal the Chinese resources. The Chinese had capital, they had raw materials, they had the means of production, they had a great location to the market, and they had the will, but they didn't have middle and senior management that could organize all that. So all that one had to do was to convince some Koreans or some Taiwanese to come to China. The problem with that was that both of those countries were at war with China. So it was a small detail. <laughs> at about the same time, two things happened that changed my world. The first was my boss at Nike and I began to argue with each other. And again, being John McEnroe-like, I didn't really show the proper respect for him. I admit that. And he decided that it was probably time for Pete to leave China. I had been in China long enough. And after our most recent argument, I got a call from headquarters, which was very infrequent, from one of the vice presidents. And he said, Pete, we think you've probably been in China long enough. We think it's time for you to move. Uh, I wasn't being fired, which I was grateful for. He said, we'd like you to go to Yugoslavia. <laughs> At that point, I agreed with him. Uh, I was tired, and I was a corporate guy. And I said, by all means, I'll go. Between the time that he said that and I was to take what we call a look-see trip, something else happened, and that was that Taiwan 
decided to permit people in Taiwan who had familial connections in the mainland to go visit. And then it hit me. Now we have the opportunity to bring that expertise, that manufacturing, shoemaking expertise, to China. So I convinced the right people to let me leave Nike, to turn around and become a supplier to Nike in cooperation with one of the Taiwan suppliers. And it's a complicated uh, description, so I won't waste your time with it. But in 1988, we set up this company called GrowthLink, and we is myself, a fellow from Taiwan, and a fellow from Hong Kong. And GrowthLink is the absolute antithesis of a name you would want for an Asian to pronounce. It's got THs, Ns, and Ls. But it was a shelf company, the name was there, and we needed to move fast. So we set that up in August of 1988. And in October of 1988, we went to Fujian province. Uh, that's just due west of Taiwan on the mainland. And we leased a factory, and we began our first shoe factory. Our dream in that day was to have one successful shoe factory that we could su successfully supply footwear to a worldwide brand like Nike. 25 years later, today, we have 17 of those facilities. We're in, as Kim enumerated, Fujian. We have one in a place called Taizong near Shanghai. We've got some down in Vietnam near Ho Chi Minh, Bandung, Indonesia, and most recently in uh, a town near Chennai, South India. I was just calculating the other day, we've got 1.3 million square meters of workshop. That's factory buildings, which uh, knocked my socks off when I heard that. We've got, as Kim said, 87,000 people in those countries that we directly employ. We produce 6 million pairs of shoes a month. That's a pile of shoes. Nike buys roughly 300 million pairs of shoes a year, so that's a lot of shoes also. In, let's see if I can get to the, there, I should have gone there sooner, I apologize. But you can see our headquarters now is in Taiwan, there's Shanghai, we have a big trading operation in Hong Kong, there's Ho Chi Minh, Bandung, Indonesia, and here's Chennai in India. In, well, I'll say five years ago, that company, GrowthLink, merged with my partner's company in Taiwan, which uh, is a public company. Uh, you can't see this, but this is a page off of uh, Yahoo Finance from Monday. This is the stock quote for Monday. It's trading at $52.30 NT dollars per share. And you can't see it also, I'm sorry for that, but that's a 52-week high. It's also a historic high, 52.30. So the company is doing, doing very well right now. We manufacture Nike, of course. We also make Bauer, which used to be a sub-brand of Nike. Cole Haan we manufacture, which used to be a sub-brand. Converse is a sub-brand of Nike. We make Clarks for the UK, Doc Martens. We make ski boots for a company out of Italy called Technica and their sub-brand Nordica. We also make about half of the golf balls that Nike sells. We make some Nike soccer balls and we also make about half of the airbags that go into the soles of Nike shoes. Well, most of you can't even see them, so you don't know they're in there, but that's big business. Okay, I thought I would share with you a little bit about how this business works. Uh, it's obviously a labor-intensive industry, 87,000 people. And believe me, there is no virtue in having 87,000 people. If we could do it with one, then we would, but we can't. Shoe manufacturing is almost always the first entrant into an emerging economy because of the labor intensity, low-skilled jobs, and low cost. The cycle usually lasts about 20 years. This cycle for China's lasted 25 years before it moves on. And I'll depict that for you here in just a sec. The terms of trade 
are always price, quality, and delivery with emphasis on price. In the cost of a shoe, there are three main components. The first one is labor. The second, thank you. The second is raw materials, and the third is overhead. We've found that overhead and raw materials are virtually inelastic the world over. If you're in Portland, or you're in Shanghai, or you're somewhere in Yugoslavia, the cost of the raw materials, the cost of the factory, the cost of the utility is the same. The only thing that's variable or elastic is the labor cost. And I can depict that here. This shows that in China, the average worker in one of our factories makes about $350 a month. That's inclusive of all of the social costs that we have. It does not include bonuses, production bonuses, or overtime. And the 100% represents their efficiency rate. I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but China is the standard for efficiency in this industry. In Indonesia, the same worker gets $230 a month and is about 80% 80 per, 80 as efficient as China. Vietnam, 285, 75% as efficient. And in India, 165 a month, 50% as efficient as China. And I, I want to note that the uh, China number when we first started was about $80 a month in 1988. So they've had huge uh, growth in uh, labor cost. So you can do the math. Anything that you can get that's less than $350, and you multiply that by 87,000, you can have considerable savings by moving to another country. Now, so that's one of the reasons that we're in these four countries. The other one is that both Nike and ourselves have a risk mitigation policy. We don't want to have too much coming out of one country. As the Chinese say, a smart rabbit has three holes. I was the first employee of this organization, and I developed the uh, capability in Fujian, in uh, Vietnam. I was not involved in the development in Indonesia. That came with the merger. And I developed uh, the capacity in India. Today, I'm mainly involved in board work governance and strategic planning, and so I don't have day-to-day -day responsibility, and I've sold much of what uh, I originally had when we merged, but I'm still active. And that brings me up to today. I thought because India is the most recent source that we've developed, I'd share some of the photos. Uh, we started the negotiation in 2005, and this is, you got to admit, this is Gumpian. Uh, this is obviously me uh, with all of the high-level bureaucrats for the state of Tamil Nadu in South India, with Gandhi looking there over our shoulders. This is me with my partner, my Indian partner, here with three bureaucrats who are helping us determine which piece of land we should procure. That is the land that we procured. This is the construction phase. And I thought noteworthy here, you may not be able to see it from there, is that all of the men had hard hats on and none of the women have hard hats on. <laughs> this is the construction phase again, same piece of land. This is the first day that we open the doors for employment. Those people are waiting to be hired. This is in an area that the, China, that the uh, Indian government terms backward, so you know that it really is backward. This is their first industrial job. This is called a puja. It's a Hindu ceremony for opening ceremonies, just uh, blessings. And then lastly, this is a, a, a tent, an advertisement that they put in the rooms of the local hotel. You know, here in the West, we have cockroaches, we have rats, but they've got a big problem. Monkeys actually do come in your room if you don't shut the window. OK, that concludes my third point about how did I get here. 
Next, then, is the fourth point, some learnings and some conclusions. The first is that, in my estimation, in the last 30 years, no country has come as far as China has. And I can uh, best illustrate that. Of course, we have to admit that they handicapped themselves when they closed the doors uh, in 1949, virtually. But uh, with the emergence of Deng in 1979 and his open door policy, things have changed. And I think anybody who's been there can admit that they really have gone to, from zero to 60 in only a few seconds. I can best explain or illustrate this for you by telling now the tale of two banquets. The first banquet is in Fuzhou in 1985. We're sitting at a banquet table. There are probably 10 of us, three Nike executives, 26 years old, and seven of my counterparts from China who are representatives of the government. At that time, every business was a state-owned enterprise. There was no free enterprise. They had on the misnamed Mao jackets. Those are actually not Mao jackets, but that's what we call them. We had on our Western business suits. The food was bland, may not have been plentiful, although we didn't know that. There were people starving in China at that time. The meeting would have started off with our host welcoming us to the table and then spending roughly 30 minutes telling us of the virtues of the Chinese communist system, of how bad capitalism was, and how bad Americans were. He would then toast us with Mao Tai, which is the Chinese version of tequila, and we would drink that with joy, and we would follow that with a diluted orange drink uh, that was universal across the country. And there would probably have been no discussion after that. The quiet room for the rest of the meal. The second banquet is in the year 2000. Same city, Fuzhou. Same cast of characters sitting around the table. I'm still there. I'm not an executive now. I, uh, for Nike, I now own the factory. In fact, Nike is nowhere near the table. They rely on us to be their representatives now. I have my partner from Taiwan, my partner from Hong Kong. And then the other seven people are the same bureaucrats, but now they're my partners. They have left the state-owned enterprise and have joined me in private enterprise. And the first thing we talk about is our strategy, our corporate strategy. And then we talk about some tactics. And then somebody starts talking about a recent vacation they took outside of China or myself outside of China. Then we start talking about stock tips that we're buying. We're talking about houses or second homes that they and me have bought. And all of the conversation is washed down with French wine that's probably diluted with Sprite. <laughs> and it's all interrupted by constant phone calls on their cell phones. That's how far China has come. I think I've also concluded that although Phil Knight, when he was envisioning this, or even when Richard Nixon was envisioning this in 1971, Phil's motivation wasn't to go produce this in China, but it's a byproduct. And that is that because of the open, open door policy and because of the efforts of companies like Phil Knight's, more people have been lifted out of poverty than anywhere else in the history of man. And I see that as a total success on all fronts, whether it was the intention or a byproduct. And that's led me to the conclusion that business, and we've heard this before, can really be something that we can all commonly share in. The Taiwanese from Taiwan who were at war with the Chinese are now sitting at the same table. They can't talk about politics first. They talk about business first. And then they can talk about politics. I had this experience just last month. My partner from Taiwan, my partner from China, 
they came to realize that one of them was in the army in Taiwan on Mazu, firing missiles over to Xiamen. And they would face each other through binoculars, and they were both on the other side of the Taiwan Straits at the same time. They realized that in my presence, and it gives me goose bumps right now just thinking about it. But that's been the tool or the success of business. Uh, the second thing, or the third thing, that I've concluded, and this will sound Gumpian, cultural sensitivity is important. I spent four years at University of Oregon studying Chinese and Chinese history. I spent many years living amongst and working with and being partners of Chinese, but it didn't really strike me. One thing didn't really strike me until I had this experience. I was late for a flight in Fuzhou to go back to Hong Kong, and the driver was rushing me, and I was giving her pressure to get me there fast. When we arrived at the terminal, there was a throng of people, as it always were, sending off the travelers, and the throng of people were all facing, of course, the terminal. None of them saw me arrive. I'm behind them. And all of the travelers had gone in already, so because I was late. And I worked my way through the crowd, and I admit, because I was late and not as polite as I needed to be, I pushed my way through. And just as I got to the opening in the fence where I would be inside the terminal and they could not go, I felt somebody tug on my left arm. And I'm 6'5", and uh, had some momentum, so I pulled away. And just as I went through the gate, I turned and looked. And here is a fellow, 80 years old or so, about this tall. And he's looking up at me, and he's pointing. And he's saying in Chinese, you can't treat us that way anymore. I didn't think anything of it until maybe a week later, I was reflecting, what did he mean? And something in my mind said, you remember that lesson that you heard about foreigners in China in the late 1800s and the early 1900s? Anyway, you all know the story. I put those together and realized that any time they see a tall white guy, that's the first thing that comes to their mind, is that experience in the late 19. Hundreds, or sorry, late 1800s and early 1900s. I wished I had learned that lesson much sooner. So cultural sensitivity is important. Sharon, where are you? How are we for time? I can cut this short or I can keep going. I think this one's important, so I can cut some of these out. They're not all that important. Are there any students in the room? Okay. I'm going to dedicate this one to you. I don't want you to misunderstand that this story is as beautiful as it sounds. It's a nice story. But what I didn't tell you was that I spent a lot of days wondering, what the hell am I going to do? How am I going to find a job? I worked at ESCO in the mill in the foundry for a while. I worked on a green chain in Kalama, Washington for a while. I painted houses for a while. I had a good job with UPS driving a truck for a while. None of those are the spy job or the diplomat job that I envisioned that I should have, but they all provided me with valuable lessons, and I just want you to not misunderstand. This, this has been a long journey, but has paid off very well. The next thing, and I'll say this to the students uh, but to the crowd in general, because we're mostly Americans here. And that's about corruption. I didn't understand corruption until I got to Asia. And another way to say that is, today, I know I don't have to go to Asia to find it. <laughs> Just came back from New York last week, and the headlines there are that many New York State legislators admit that the legislature is corrupt. You don't have to go to New York to find it. You can go to Salem, where we discovered last year the kickback system that was working for the state prison system for food provisioning. In fact, you don't even have to go to Salem. You can stay right here in Portland with the kickback system that was working for the parking meters. I wished I'd had some education, either practical or instructional, 
And if Scott Dawson were here for the School of Business Administration, I would encourage him to have a course on corruption, how it appears, how it works, and how to avoid it. I've found it everywhere. Wherever there's humans, there seems to be corruption. And I've also found that no matter where I am when I'm confronted with it, if I simply say to my counterpart, I'm sorry, but I can't engage in that because we're a public company and I have a high visibility customer that is a worldwide brand. And that usually, believe it or not, is enough to forestall it. Okay. Two more things, I'll be done. In China in those days, 150 foreigners, yet China is such a huge country, there were a lot of famous people who came to China, and because they only had 150 people to draw on for their audience, I got to meet a lot of interesting people, and I thought I'd share you the list, with the list. And I'm not pointing this out to boast or brag, I'm just pointing out what the condition was. I got to meet Phil Knight and work with him on a frequent basis. He is a wonderful human being, as we've seen here with his uh, support of Oregon. I got to meet and talk with Jane Pauley. I was interviewed on the Today Show in Tiananmen Square in 1984. I got to meet Jerry Brown, although Linda Ronstadt wasn't with him. <laughs> President Reagan, President George H.W. Bush, Ambassadors to China, Winston Lord, Stapleton Roy, Sandy Rant, Doak Barnett, and I won't waste my time describing, but that'll resonate with some people in the room, Arthur Schlesinger. <sighs> Zhu Rongji, who at the time was the uh, premier of China, and he's credited with breaking down the centralized system in China. He visited our factory. Xi Jinping, who is the president of China today and the party secretary for the country. He was the mayor of Fuzhou when I was there, so we worked from time to time, and he was the uh, vice party secretary for the province of Fujian and the governor of Fujian while we were there. Liu Mingkang, who was at the ribbon cutting for my first factory in Fujian, worked his way up to be the governor of the People's Bank of China, which is the Central Bank of China. Pete Wilson, former governor of California, Vic Atia, governor of Oregon, a fellow by the name of Sidney Rittenberg who wrote a book about the man who stayed behind. He didn't leave China after the culture, or during the Cultural Revolution, he stayed. And then last but not least, Sonny Bono. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> we can talk about that over at the reception. To end on a, on a light note, again, some differences that I've noticed between Chinese and Westerners. I, I keep a list, and this is not exhaustive, but just some highlights. Uh, we wear white at our weddings. The Chinese wear white at the funerals. We eat our soup first. The Chinese often have it towards the end of their meal. The Chinese say, you have to bend like bamboo in strong wind. And we say, you have to stand firm like an oak in strong wind. The ideal setting in the minds of the Chinese for a great dinner is with a crowd of people, hot food, a hot environment, and very noisy. In fact, they have a word, renao, which says just that. That is nirvana for a Chinese meal. For us, it's a quiet table in a dark room over in the corner, just the two of us with a candle. The Chinese orient themselves towards the south. In fact, the word for compass has south in it, right? For us, we orient ourselves to the north. First thing we look at is where is north? And lastly, this notion of asking the question, would you like a cup of tea? If I ask an American, would you like, as an American, would you like a cup of tea? he or she will either say yes or no. If he says yes, I'll give him a cup of tea. If he says no, I won't give him a cup of tea, and we go on about our business. If a Chinese asks the Chinese, would you like a cup of tea? The Chinese always says no thank you. And this Chinese always gives him a cup of tea whether he wants it or not, and they go on about their business. There's no misunderstanding. 
But if the Westerner asks the Chinese guest, would you like a cup of tea? And of course the Chinese is going to say, no, I don't give him a cup of tea. <laughs> and he's thinking, where's my tea? <laughs> and it works vice versa. OK, I'll conclude then uh, by saying that, obviously, this has been a fantastic ride for Pete Nickerson. It's been fantastic. And I hope that you'll all support Portland State. It's the largest educational institution in the state of Oregon, in case you didn't know. I'm co-chair of something called the Scholarship Campaign. And we hope to raise $50 million for scholarships for students to Portland State. And I hope that you'll support the Institute of Asian Studies. And I'll take your questions. I can hear just fine. Does anybody have a question? Yes, sir. In regard to the labor and inefficiency graph, what's the most common reason for inefficiency when I speak the labor or in other words, what is China doing that the other Korea are not doing? Uh, the learning curve is the primary reason. The Chinese have had 25, the first five years were pretty ugly. We found, though, that with proper training, and, and the other answer to your question is, the reason for inefficiency is lack of proper training. All of those countries are able to produce at the same efficiency rate when they're properly trained. We've discovered that time and time again. Does that answer your question? OK. Yes, sir. OK, uh, the question is, some people say Beijing, some people say Peking. Uh, I'm still saying Peking, and that's because I am a curmudgeon. In Chinese, the term Beijing means the capital of Beijing, capital of China. But I don't hear the Chinese saying Washington or Portland, the way that Americans say it. They say Washington or Portland something like that. So when they start to say Portland as Portland, I'll start to say Beijing. <laughs> but in the meantime, historically, it's been Peking. Kim. How do you say tip? How do you say frisbee? Xiaofei <laughs> <laughs> is tip, and feipan, feipan is frisbee. And I don't know what caused that, but I just had a something. I'll, I'll close with one more story, because there aren't any more questions along the line that Kim uh, is suggesting. The best way to learn a foreign language is to make some mistakes. And I'll never forget Xiaofei, and I'll never forget Feipan. Two other words I'll never forget are a result of this. I got a chance to meet the governor of Fujian province. That, uh, for me, was a big honor. And I was a little bit nervous. And when I got to meet him face to face, I remembered a word I had lived, uh, learned in Taiwan, which was jiu yang. Jiu yang means I, your, your uh, reputation precedes you, something like that. But what I said, well, no, I'll tell you the rest <laughs> of the story. I said that, something like that, to the governor. And I went home that night, and I was laying in bed, and I realized why I wasn't able to sleep. Because I hadn't said jiu yang, jiu yang. What I had said was jiang yo, jiang yo, <laughs> which means soy sauce. <laughs> oh, I'll never forget those two words either. Yeah. Thank you.